Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another Rockola repair video for you today. If you have a Rockola jukebox, especially a 496, hopefully this will help you understand a little bit of how it works as we try to figure out how it works and fix this thing. Now this one is the 496, so it uses the System 3 uh, control unit, which there's, I, I think this and maybe one other machine used it, so it's kind of the most uh, rare of the control units. So the System 1 stuff was the Profit Setter computers, I believe they called them, which was in like Rock Ola 488s, uh, uh, 480s, stuff like that. And then they had the System 2 that was in the Rock Ola 490, the 494. And then they had uh, System 3, which is this one. And then so shortly after this, they switched over to CD boxes. And they kind of redesigned this one to make it the System 4 setup. But we're working on the System 3 board today and the mechanism. So, as you can see, we've got it all torn apart. It looks crazy, but it's not that crazy. So we've got the door up in the air. We've got the front glass off. It's right here. Um, and we've got the display apart. Because on the previous video that we did on this, we were working on this display. So we had to repair the board to get the display working again, which we kind of wanted to do first because uh, if you can read the display, it kind of gives you a little bit of information about what's going on with the machine. So there's some LEDs up here that light up, and on the cover here, it shows you what they mean. The one that uh, is lit up now says default pricing, uh, which just basically means that it hasn't been set up yet, but it's actually up and running. Uh, and the display says 100 uh, which I think is the most popular selection, which is just a generic number because the battery has been replaced, so it forgot all its settings. And then 284 is the position that it's at right now. It's at record 284, uh, or it says it is. I wonder if we're even close to that. Looks to me like we're at record 248. Hmm. Or one, 124, something like that. I don't know. We'll figure that out later, right? But since we just turned it on and it hasn't been spinning, maybe it's, it doesn't know where it's at yet. But the problem with this right at the moment is whenever you let it operate, it just spins and spins and spins. Okay? So it's spinning around. It never comes to the home position. And we're trying to figure out why that is. So... Now that I look at it, it does seem like it's not lined up right. Like it says we're at 106, but we're at 137. Uh, that ain't right. Joe, that's not even close to right. It's broke. It's broke. That's his answer for everything. It, we're trying to troubleshoot, and he just wants to tell me it's broke. Come on now. All right, so let's turn it off and back on and see if it uh, catches it different. So we'll let's do we'll turn it off first. So we'll turn it off, and then I'm going to put it in operate mode, and then we'll turn it on and see if it can tell where it is. So it's going to initialize and then go up to default price. So let's see if it can catch itself at home position. Normal operation is when it comes on, it will turn around maybe one time and then stop. It can tell if it's on 100 or 200 because of that switch you hear in the back. There's a big clunk going on. I'm not sure what that is, but basically that switch is getting pressed. So if I stop it there, that's at about home position. But you can see here it says we're at 282 um, when we're really at 200. And so the second time around now we're at 172 so I don't think that it's counting right uh, it could be we have this misadjusted but when it comes up it kind of wants to be at the position that it's at now so let's try resetting it with it at that position
course, this wouldn't fix it. We're just trying to diagnose it. Started it moving. Might take it a little while to index itself and know where it's at. Hmm, looking better. So we're at uh, 155. It says we're at 145, so that's not... Yeah, so we probably didn't have it stopped right at the index position. That's probably a little closer. If this is all confusing, we'll clarify here in a minute. But. So we're trying to start it at zero. And see if it can figure out where it's at. It might help us understand how it works. Okay, we'll let it go around twice. So we are at 221 or 121. 221. So I think the problem is, you know, usually after it played a record, it would uh, hang it up and uh, stop at zero. And then whenever you turned it on, it would know that it was at zero and start indexing by counting the little things on the side. Um, and uh, that would get it going. So it's counting properly as long as you start at zero. But there ought to be some way for it to fix itself if it was turned off where it's not at zero. But ours isn't doing that. And it's not stopping when it gets to zero, uh, I guess because it can't tell that it's at zero. Now the unfortunate part of this is we don't have schematics for this one. I can't find them. But I'm going to look here on the side and see if I can figure out how it's supposed to determine that it's at zero position. Usually there's a home switch that it hits, but on this particular one I can't see one. So uh, I haven't found that yet. So I was thinking that it was just doing it by counting... Um, with the optic on the side, but I don't know. So let me see what I can figure out and uh, I'll come back. Okay, so this is the optic from the 496. It also appears to be the optic from the CD boxes. So the, uh, what do they call that? The CD, the Laser 2000 and the 3000, the Mirage 3000. So uh, the next Rockola was apparently used the same sensor board. So if you look at the other side, our mystery is solved. Look at this little number here. So this is reading the encoder wheel, and that's what's counting. These two should catch the uh, should catch the home position because of the way it's all set up. It seems like a strange way to do it. See how it was silk screened for um, Oct 2 and Oct 1? Optical circuit 2, optical circuit 1, maybe that's what that means. But that's not how it was put together. They, they just put some taller ones up above the other one. And it looks like that's probably factory. Um, and they did silk screen it in where you could use either one, right? So I guess that's just how it came from the factory. And then uh, it comes down to here, jumps across that. So it's getting... Let's see if I can figure out how it's working. So there is a resistor. There's no silk screen on the top. Or there's no... Uh, traces on the top. So the one is connected to one of the voltages, I guess. And then the other one is connected to the same trace that the inside one is. And then on this side, our strange one here. This is just is also connected to a resistor. 
I'm trying to figure out how it sends the signal back. Is it... Hmm. Is that one separate? I mean, it has to have a separate signal. J1 runs to there, which is C1, and then to the chip, yeah. So that one, yeah, it does, it looks like it's connected because all the flux. Well, I think we kind of can tell how it must have been designed. Oh yeah, it's not connected. See the little square cut out around it? It just looks like it's connected. So this bottom left one here is our signal. Yeah, so it's two separate signals. Just making sure. <laughs> okay, so those could just be dirty. Or they're bad. I wonder if there's a part number on it. It kind of, it almost looks like there's a housing or something missing. Mm, yeah, it kind of looks like there was some kind of pot glue or whatever potting on it. What do you think? Has that been torn apart by something? Maybe I can find another picture of this assembly and see if I'm missing something. The part of the smaller one is H22A1, which I found this in the Rockola 3000 manual. It uses the same part but it doesn't say what the part number is of this, these extra ones here. Just enough to mess us up. And as you can see, there's no part number on them. So if they are messed up, we'll just have to get generic with it. Okay, so, uh... I don't think, I don't know if there's a way to check those. So, see how they're up higher than this? That makes sense if you look at the encoder wheel on the actual machine. So on the side there is this black encoder wheel here that runs through the sensor. And so, you see all the little teeth are close to the edge. That's what this, the, the one sensor is reading that gives us the, you know, where it can tell what record we're on. And then when you get to the home position, there is this gap that's farther in that this sensor wouldn't be able to see, but the other one would. So it must be that it's set up where whenever that thing sees that hole, it stops, and that's the home position. So just our top set of optics either isn't working or the board isn't reading them or whatever. So we're just going to try to simply clean it and put it back in and make sure it's adjusted in the right position. Okay, so we got it back in and it's doing the same thing. So I have a logic probe hooked up to the board still from where we were working on it the last video. And you can see as it turns that that LED blinks. Okay, so if I go down here, there are only four wires, not five wires. So one of them is high all the time. That's going to be our power, right? One of them is low all the time. That is our uh, that is our uh, ground. One of them is pulsing all the time. You can see that it's in rhythm with the LED because, and when it gets to the middle, it stops because there's that spot in the encoder where there's no where there's no. Uh, way for the, the signal to get from one optic to the other, right? It's blocked. So it just stays low that whole time, right? So if I go over to this other one, I can get my connection on it here. Oh. Come on, you sucker. Okay, it's that one. We are low, and here's the, see how we went right through the home position? The home position, of course, is where there's records missing. Yep, 
it just always stays low. So what's going on? It's not seeing through that hole. So it's never creating the signal uh, where it sees through the hole and I guess tells it that that's the home position in the stop. So we've got something wrong with that optic, those optics, and they are not listed in the parts manual that I have. Oh, what are they doing to me? Let's see if we can tell if it's lined up right. Maybe it's in the wrong spot. Okay, I'm going to turn it. It's going to make a lot of noise, so watch yourselves. One's purring. Whoa. I went past it. I don't have enough hands here, people. What do y'all think? It looks to me like it's lined up perfect. <laughs> this little freaking switch over here. Are they up too high? Man, it could be they're up too high. Hmm, I wonder if we're missing some spacers from this little board. And it should be farther out. Or uh, that bracket looks like it can move. Hmm. All right, we might have some options here. Maybe it just it doesn't look like it's quite lined up, does it? Yeah, look at that. The optic is at the top of those little things. So I don't think it's shining through. I think we got the board down too low. So I looked on the I looked on the uh, in the manual, and there are not any little missing spacers or anything. But if I can get to it, where are we? We're lost. What happened? <laughs> Look, people, I'm trying to show you all of the good stuff, okay? If you don't like it, you can pass forward. Where are we? <laughs> there we are. Look at that. We've got it buried. If it'll grab that. There we go. Look at that. It's touching. So we're just too low. So I need to figure out a way to make that up higher. It must be bent or something, or I might just loosen that screw and it moves. But we need to get that up. In the manual it says 3 64ths of an inch. Right now we're at zero of an inch. Okay, it let me pivot it a little bit by just loosening that screw over there. So I have some clearance now, which uh, hopefully will work a lot better for us. Hopefully. Hopefully. Keep your fingers crossed, people. It's still reading. We got that one right, at least. Ha! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Fixed another one. Let's see if it'll do it again. I'd like to thank all of the little people. Without your support, I could not do what I do. I mean, I know I'm great, but... I, by the way, I did this gimmick one time on a video, and some idiot replied and was like, Oh, you think you're so... Sp Buddy, it's a joke, okay? Lighten up a little bit. All right. <laughs> all right, so, uh... Wow. I think it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So, we got to fix the display back together. I showed this on the previous video. Now, we worked on this, we got this thing working right, but obviously that's not how it's supposed to go. <coughs> Excuse me. The yup, yup, yup got me. 
or I need to clear my throat. This is the original keyboard that goes on there. Notice the problem. The way they designed this thing, it had a membrane, which if you don't know how that works, basically you, there's, there is a printed piece of plastic, and when you press on it, it touches another piece of plastic, and that conducts enough through the lines to be a switch, basically, where you, con you connect the two electrical uh, lines together. But the problem is these things, they, they rot, actually. After, they're, after they get pretty old, they don't work anymore. That's all screwed up. And this flexible tape here, if you get a little crack in it or any kind of corrosion where it crimps, um, it just stops working. So we had three of these and none of them worked right. They had buttons that were screwed up. So we've been wanting to do this for a while. This is a big problem. People run into it all the time. That keyboard is very similar to the CD boxes too, the Laser 2000, the Laser 2000 and the CD 3000. Okay, so we thought, hey, why not just drill holes and put a bunch of buttons on it? So that's what we did. We drilled holes through the original spots and just put buttons. Now we got one a little crooked. It'll be all right, people. People, it doesn't have to be perfect. People. It's close enough to perfect for me. That's for that's for our buddy Nate. I know he's watching. That's about as good as we could get it. Now I'm sure you could do it better, but we just drilled and put buttons <laughs> in the holes. We put a little silicone on the back so they don't come off, and then we just wired it all up and made a new connector. And the old stuff is still there, but it's not going to work because we're not going to plug it in. What do you think? I think that'll probably work. We're going to try it. So I'm going to mount that back onto this and mount it back up in there where it goes. And then we'll see if we can get any of the selections to work. Uh, I couldn't tell before if they were working because we couldn't read the display. But now that we have the display fixed, maybe it will, uh, maybe it will cooperate. We have to do one last thing, though, before we do that. This little chip is unpopulated on this board because I pulled it out while we were working on some stuff. That chip, we figured out on the previous video, uh, drives these LEDs on this display. Not the actual digits, but the, the little lights. So it's used to drive those four lights. So i got to put one of those back in. It's a ULN2803. So we'll put that back in, and then we'll, uh, we'll bolt this back onto the keyboard and see if we can get any of the selections to work. What do you think? <sighs> Looks great. Okay, um, so we haven't played it yet because we haven't had the keyboard working. Okay, so if I press the fourth button on this, it should add a credit. Yep, one play. Okay. <laughs> yeah, buddy. So if I do three, it'll start a record, so we're going to not do that. One, two worked. One, three worked. You can't start anything with four, right? One, four worked. One, five works. One, six works and reset works. One, seven works. One, eight works. One, nine works. 20 works, perfect. Uh, view hits works. Two, 30, seven. I have no clue if it'll pick up or anything. It is on 237. It sounds like we only have one speaker working. This one's stone dead. This one's working. That one's dead. <laughs> uh, crazy. So this is the left channel. That's the right channel, obviously. So we got one on the left channel, one on the right channel. 
unless they're not wired right. So they may have the wires reversed or something. I don't even know how you get to that down there where the speakers are. Hmm. Well, that's our next thing. But hey, the thing's playing and we got the uh, keyboard working. And it seems like it's up and running. This one, they've got a capacitor on the red wire. This one, they've got a capacitor on the black wire, which I think they do as a... Um, I think they do that to get so they're out of phase with each other. Or they're whatever. I think it's supposed to be like that. Um... That capacitor could be bad, though. To hell with it. I'm going to swap the wires. I don't think that it matters, though, the way they've got that. Yeah, and these are kind of trained where it looks like they've always been like that. Yeah, no difference. So that's probably supposed to be like that. Um, let me get a multimeter, and I'll just check the uh, resistance of the of the um, speaker and then uh, we'll jump over that cap if we need to and see if we can get at least that one back okay so this thing measures 7 ohms resistance I know resistance doesn't really tell you but that's all I can do right so uh, I think it's probably fine and if I plug the wiring from that side into this speaker this speaker no longer works so kind of seems like one of our channels is completely out um, so that is what it is. Okay. Uh, also, whenever it lays it down, it kind of stutters a little bit, and jerks. A lot of times, that's a physical thing. But on this on this particular box, there is a mech board over here, and it seems like when the relay, if you, if I wiggle the relay, it makes it work a little better. So I think we just got a bad relay socket. But we're kind of getting there. I wonder if it did that because it needs to get a. Uh, let's see if it's messed up again. Uh, I don't like that. Oh, it's playing. It's trying to play another one. Yeah. So see how it's not doing anything now. If you mess with this relay, big ice cube relay, it kind of goes through the motions here. There's cool and the game. All right, so um, I think we got amp problems. And I don't like how this is not stopping where it's supposed to stop again. Did I lean on the basket and mess it up again? I don't know, it's, keep, it's trying to keep playing the same things. All right, I gotta reset all of the, all of the uh, credits, I guess. Um, and then we'll go from there. So I hit the button that clears the selections and it went back to home and stopped. So, okay. So uh, let's see about, uh, let's look at the mech board with the, the cube uh, relay in it and see if we can figure that out. So here is this little mech board, 55180-A. Same thing, it seems like it was in the 496, which was the 45 box that could also do CDs. And then it was in the uh, 498, I think there's a 498. Uh, and then it was in the Laser 2000, and it was in the, uh, I mean the Laser 2000, yeah, did I say Laser 2000? Laser 2000 and the Mirage 3000, which were the CD boxes. It may have been in some later CD boxes too, but that early age of the CD boxes, there's not much... <laughs> there's not much information about all that out there. Uh, I actually have one of the Laser 2000s we're going to do a whole series of videos on because that's fascinating to me that it was like the first CD box. So This one's actually the first CD box, but it was like an add-in. But the, the Laser 2000 was strictly CDs. Okay, so yeah, so whenever I have the problem where it stops, if I wiggle this relay... Um, it does its thing. So 
So let's see what the socket looks like. Looks like we've scraped the crap out of the leads. So I think maybe we spray some contact cleaner down in there. Let's see what the bottom looks like. Let's see what these solder joints look like. What do you think? Eh. They're probably all right, but I'm going to reflow all of them. Okay, so I'm just going to reflow some solder. I'm going to clean the socket, clean the bottom of this. It could be the contacts in here, but since whenever you wiggle it, they work. I don't know. And of course, we could always just put a new relay in it. I don't have one of these, but... It's a 24-volt coil. SKNP20. Or 2C. Something like that. Sky Electronics. It's just a very simple relay with two sets of contacts. The play relay, I believe. This one is a different one. Okie dokie. So let me clean it up a little bit. So it is still doing it. And if I wiggle the wire harness, doesn't do anything. If I wiggle the ribbon cable, it doesn't do anything. But the cube relay, if I mess with it, it does something. I don't know. I have another one of those boards. I guess we'll try swapping it. It could be the actual socket, but everything looked fine. So, uh, and it won't cancel sometimes. I think that's a similar situation. So we're, we're still messing with that. So here's the one that's in there. I took the relay apart and it seems fine. The throw isn't great on it. But it is working. And if you test the continuity, everything's fine. Um, and then if I put it in the socket and I test continuity through the socket, everything's fine. But, I have these two boards. This is the one that we're using. It's cleaner. This is another one. I don't even know where we got this, but it's got a bunch of, you know, corro well, not, it's not really corrosion. It's just filth. It's got a bunch of filth on it. Uh, but, uh, I can compare values. And this is an MPS A56 here. And when I compare between the middle leg and this one, it's almost shorted. It's like it's 0.1. When I do it on this one, it's a uh, 0.8. I mean, a 0.5. I wonder if it's because I got this relay in though. That might do it. All right, let me try it again. Yeah, if I take the the um, relay out, it's fine. So I don't know. Everything tests fine. And we've drenched it in contact cleaner, and it actually looks fairly clean. And it connects through with the multimeter. Hmm. I don't know. You saw it though. Clear as day. If I press on that, it makes it work. And I can't find anything that's maybe broken half or something. None of that. I don't know. I don't know. It's a mystery to me. And if the uh, if you wiggle the ribbon cable, it, it won't do it. If you wiggle the connector up here, it won't do it. It's just if you push on the cube relay. This is the kind of crap we run into. I hate intermittent problems. They're so hard to figure out because they don't. They'll start working and everything's cool, and then they'll act up days later. Huh. And so those big old power transistors are NTE 392s. Uh, but they seem fine. And everything's working if you mess with it. Um, which tells me bad solder joints. 
So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to re-solder all the solder joints. Deal with it. Okay, folks, so I'm trying to figure out how in the world this thing works. This is the latch relay because it actually latches one way and then the other. This is the reverse relay. So this is the one that when I tapped on it, it would make it start working. Like whenever it was laying it down, right? Well, now it won't cancel. And it's the reverse relay, which makes sense, right? So, again, these are the wrong schematics. These are from an earlier one, but it's, it looks like it's pretty similar. So I've been messing with this for like literally two or three hours. Just trying to wrap my head around how it works. So there is a black wire that comes on this board and it appears this board and goes over to a switch uh, which is the, the cancel switch and then there is a black and orange wire which also goes to the cancel switch and if the two connect that's supposed to cancel the record and return it. Now on the back of the box if you hit the cancel button you hear a click 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 right when you hit the cancel on the tone arm, it goes click, 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 but you're hearing it from, like, the amplifier. So what it's doing is it's turning on the mute relay because you're, you're hanging up the record. So it's muting it. So what's that tell you? It tells you all the wiring and everything's fine. So we must have some kind of problem with this board or something, right? So if you look, whenever that thing connects, the black orange and the black line, part of my chicken scratch, Basically what it does is this is the ground line and instead through a, a switch on the cam that's closed it connects the black and orange line to ground. So the black and orange line goes over here and goes back over to the MPU and the amp which is, turns on the mute relay. But you're basically connecting this point right here to ground through the switch that you're hitting, the cancel switch. So you're taking this black line here and making it up here instead. Well if the latch relay is a certain way, which is this one, that ground then connects through to the reverse relay, which is this one. The reverse relay would then pull in and reverse everything. So With that, uh, that is not happening. That's never happening. So then I started thinking, well, maybe it's this side of the line, you know, because it's getting the ground. Maybe it's not getting the power. So this side connects over to him. Pin four, which they are calling, uh, what did I lose it? They're calling it the cam one line coming from the CPU. So it's like the power. So it comes down through here. Blah, 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 off the page and through a switch that connects it to this line. This bottom line, which is a red and blue line. So again, these are the wrong schematics, but they're similar. So here is our cam one line. It comes down. It goes through the cam switch one. Uh, whenever it's in the position that it's in, which is down, I guess, that connects the power from here to here, this red and blue line. And this red and blue line is basically the power input that is before the fuse. So my whole point is, for this to have power, this switch has to be closed. So see how on the earlier ones, like the 490, the Rockola 490, it had four switches, number one, number two, outer, number two, inner, and number three. Well, guess what? By the 496, they have simplified it. And there are now just two switches. So it looks like they've got rid of the number two, inner, and the number two, outer. So this is the cam number one switch. I don't destroy this freaking record. Uh, this is the cam number one switch, which is closed, but there's 67 ohms resistance in the switch. So in other words, the switch is screwed up. So uh, I'm going to try taking that off, cleaning it, repairing it, replacing it, something, and uh, see if that works. I think to test my theory though, I'm just going to put a little jumper on it and see if, uh, see if everything works. Okay, so I have removed the offending switch. So I'll show you what I'm talking about. 
I try to make these videos where people can understand them, but I can't tell if they can understand them because I don't have any feedback because nobody's here right now except me. Okay, so this is just your typical micro switch. Now, I see these in arcade games constantly. So this is like, ain't no thing to me. You know what I mean? We get these all the time. This particular one has a little roller on the blade here, the actuator. A lot of times we have them that don't even have an actuator in arcade games because they use them for push buttons and joysticks and all that stuff. So here's the theory at least. Right now, this is your common terminal here. Okay. And this is your normally connected terminal, right? Normally closed, whatever. So right now those two should be connected. So if we test it with the multimeter, point 0.2, point 0.1 ohms resistance. Okay, that's how it's supposed to be. My leads have about point 0.2 ohms resistance in them. So I just I just shut it with my finger, right? So when I shut it, it disconnects the normally connected. So now it's an open line. Let it go back. It's connected again. Okay, so this one is supposed to do the same thing, but in the opposite. It's normally open, so right now it's open. So when you connect it, it's not connecting. Sometimes you'll get something like 200 ohms, 60 ohms or something like that. So that's our problem. Bad micro switch. So when I say bad... Whoa! So when I say bad, what that really means is dirty. Sometimes you can pop them apart and clean them, but a lot of times there's just too much going on inside of them to get them clean. Almost stabbed myself. This isn't one of the ones that's riveted, so it will probably pop apart. Oh yeah, it did pop apart. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, so inside of this is a bunch of dirt. Okay. So the one we were having trouble connecting to was this one. So if we could have got it apart without the whole thing breaking, we might have been able to clean, you know, the rivets on the contacts. But what can you do? So here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to see if I can get this roller off. I'm going to need that. Come on. I'm trying to save you so you may live again. So with that, with this switch being screwed up, you're not going to get power to your reverse relay, so it'll never cancel. That's my theory. Get up. Get up. I'm trying to crack everything around it and not that actuator itself. I want to save the actuator. I don't want to pull on it and bend it. There we go. Alright, so the little actuator, you can just transfer over to another switch. So there's a brand new one. We get these by the bucket loads. And if you look, there's two little lines up there in the top. If we can get this actuator in there, it'll work just like the other one. So I'm going to try to pry it apart just barely enough to slip that down in that little line. Yeah, buddy. That's more like it. Get rid of all this old stuff. So 1988 to 2022. Christmas 2022. We were able to put the actuator back in a new switch so that it may live on. Let's see if it'll do what we need it to do. 
That's normally connected. Open line. It works fine. This one is open line. Normally connected. Whew, that might do it. Okay, I'm gonna go try to put it back in and end this super long video. By the way, if you're if you're watching this video because you have one of your own, you need to check this with a multimeter first. Don't just replace it because it doesn't necessarily mean it'll fix it. But this one, you know, we tested. It's got problems. So you kind of need to use a multimeter, do just like we did, and test the switch. You can do it in the machine, but you need to unplug the wires from it. And don't don't mix up where the wires go either. Okay, folks, so I've got it all back in. Uh, I've turned down the volume. If you saw earlier, we have a speaker and a half working, so uh, the amp needs a lot of work. And, uh, you know, copyright laws, I can't just play you all kinds of stuff. But let's see if it's going to work. Two, one, two. It's looking for it. Everything seems to be cool so far. Went through the AB switch. Oh, it has selected a record. That's a dirty record, though. Thing's filthy. Huh? Anything? Huh? I guess I've got it turned down so low you can't hear it at all. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when it eventually gets to the end, the purple one, Keep your fingers crossed. The purple one has spoken. <laughs> there it goes. Oh, yeah. Mm. It's like butter, people. All right, so if you get that problem where it won't reverse, it could be a lot of things, but it could be that switch. And again, this is the 496, so it's a little different than the 490 and all of that. But I hope that helps you. Ours is a little farther along. I'll do another video where we work on the amplifier because obviously uh, we've got some major issues with it. So hope you enjoyed it. Looks like we've got it kind of mechanically doing its thing. I still need to disassemble the gripper arm and oil it and all that because I see it stuttering a little bit. And I think that's what's going on there. But uh, very cool. So uh, we've got it kind of doing its thing where we can make selections that will play the record and then hang it up. So mechanically, it's at least functioning. It just needs to function a little better. And uh, sonically, it's not working very well at all yet. So if you've got one of these, that's what you need to look at. I hope it helped you. Leave your comments down below. Make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film all this for you. By the way, you know how you can support our channel. Go check out our website. Go to lionsarcade.com. We have a parts page on our website uh, where we are. Uh, we list a bunch of the stuff that we use uh, on our to do repairs on our videos. So things like um, tools and oil and, and stuff like that that we that we use whenever we do these. So go check that out. You might see something on there you'd like. Now, if you follow one of those links, it will take you to Amazon. Once you go on Amazon through one of our links, anything you buy on Amazon, even if it's not something from our link, uh, pays us a little percentage of your purchase without raising your rates or anything, just as a fee for advertising and sending you there through that link. So we appreciate everybody that's been doing that. Finally, last but not least, don't forget to check out my brother Donnie. The link is down below. That is my brother's channel here on YouTube. We do arcade games, jukeboxes, pinball machines, all of that cool stuff. And my brother Donnie does old vehicles, old buildings, things like that. So uh, I'm over there with them on the channel. Hope you enjoyed it. I can't wait to get this thing working. So this is a Rockola 496. If you have this problem, though, it's going to be a similar problem on your Rockola 490, 494, 488, 480, um, the ones that used computer systems. So I hope you enjoyed it. We will see you on the next one.